everybody hear me okay? Yes, okay. Um, <clears throat> when uh, Dr. Banner and um, uh, the others asked me to give this talk, I couldn't really decide what to call it. I thought about calling it CSI Texas. It's not as much fun as you think. Uh, <clears throat> because what you see on TV isn't necessarily what you get. Um, even though most of what they do is reasonably accurate, it's, um, they find out a little bit too much from their evidence and they find it out a little bit too fast. Uh, um, any of my people can tell you that uh, we're like all government agencies and the wheels turn very slow. It takes us a long time sometimes to get answers, which uh, irritates everybody, including ourselves. <clears throat> but uh, there we go. I couldn't help but, but download this. I went to their site and it said, download our theme song. I said, all right, I will. <clears throat> I think that's what makes it so popular is the music. I've never actually watched a full episode. but uh, uh, what, I what I want to do uh, today is, is talk a little bit about... Um, um, the kinds of things we, we do, the kinds of science we use, the kind of evidence we look at, uh, what we can tell, and then we'll also go over some of the types of cases that we've uh, handled in our lab, some specific cases. Uh, here's uh, four that we're going to look at. Uh, we'll, we'll go back to them later. Uh, big uh, drug kingpin, uh, the murder of Madeline Murray O'Hare and family, uh, Austin businessman uh, uh, Roger Skaggs uh, murdered his wife, and Round Rock... Uh, <clears throat> juvenile murder day is uh, a neighbor, uh, also juvenile. But uh, in general, this is the kind of things that, that, w that we do. We do scientific uh, examination of evidence uh, from crime scenes. We manage technical programs, which we'll go into later, which are uh, things called APHIS, CODIS, and NIBIN, and we'll go into those a little bit later. Uh, we also go to crime scenes when requested from uh, smaller agencies and Texas Rangers, who we work with, and provide expert testimony. Um, in the <clears throat> amount of time that I spent on the bench, uh, I probably testified uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 800 times in court. So, uh, And this is the location of our laboratories. We actually have 12 laboratories, and uh, of course I'm the manager of the headquarters lab. has about uh, 70 scientists at the headquarters lab, and there's about another 70 or 80 spread throughout the state. And this is the services that our laboratory actually offers. Uh, of course, DNA is the big thing now. Toxicology, which is the analysis of uh, body fluids and uh, such for uh, poisons, drugs, alcohol, etc. Controlled substances, just a fancy name for drugs. Forensic photography, trace evidence, firearms, and then these uh, uh, technical programs I was telling you about, as well as latent prints, fingerprints, and question documents, which is handwriting and computer analysis. <clears throat> At the heart of any investigation is its physical evidence, and this, uh, this is a picture of the inside of one of our evidence vaults, and you can see it's very neat and tidy. And um, every, every piece of evidence is tracked through barcode and case number, that's a fake case number, but anyway, case number, and it's stored under what we refer to as proper seal, which means it has tamper-proof or tamper-evident uh, seals on it. If you break into this, I can tell. All this is, is uh, stored in a vault, <coughs> which has uh, very limited access only to by evidence technicians. Uh, first thing we'll talk about is latent fingerprints. Uh, they refer to it as latent because you can't see it. Um, but you can visualize it through either chemical or, uh, chemical or uh, physical enhancement that's... Uh, I think some of you all saw out here they were using some uh, black powder. That's kind of what you see on TV. But uh, there are other techniques for developing fingerprints, and, and we'll actually show some video of this a little bit later. Um, one of these programs I talked about, APHIS, stands for Automated Fingerprint Identification System. And what it is, it's a computerized system that stores millions of fingerprint cards, uh, the, the images of them optically stored, and you can take an unknown fingerprint and search it versus this database, and it'll give you a certain number of hits. And then the technicians actually go in and physically make the comparisons to these to determine whether or not it really is a hit. You actually have to put the human eye on it. And here is a method called superglue method. <coughs> if you take uh, something that's covered 
or has fingerprints on it and put it in one of these expensive uh, aquariums here that we use, <laughs> cover it up and uh, drop some super glue, just plain super glue, on a, on a heated pad right here. Uh, Brian's going to be doing this in a minute. It'll just coat everything on the inside. And you will actually be able to see the fingerprints. It'll just look kind of white. But I'll show you. Uh, Brian was the fellow out at the table there. <clears throat> he made me turn off the sound while I was videotaping this because uh, he was talking too much. But you watch here. This is a little, little hot plate, and there's a piece of cotton in here, and he's going to put some super glue on it. And you watch the fumes come off this thing. See? And they will, like I said, they will just coat everything inside there. These cans have some uh, finger, excuse me, fingerprints as well as the plastic bag in there. And then what he's going to do is take this and put it under a, a laser um, and, and look through a filter, and he can actually see those fingerprints. Uh, first thing he's going to do is take those, those uh, cans that were in there and spray them with a fluorescent dye. And then he puts it, takes it into the laser room. Actually, we're going to look at the prints on this bag here, not the cans. I think. Okay. And we'll turn the lights out here and then put a filter in front of this, and you'll actually get to see the fingerprints on here. In just a second, as soon as, as soon as we put the filter in front of it. And you can see them there right here. Those are the fingers. And you can take these and, and actually photograph them um, and make the comparisons. You could also go dust it with black powder after, after you've done this to it, like he's doing right here. And you'll actually see some fingerprints. They're not as clear as the other ones. You don't get to see it. It doesn't look as good when you're actually uh, when you're, uh, videotaping it as it does in person. But you can see a fingerprint right there. Oops, get out of there, brush. Right here, yeah. And if you have a um, situation in which you, let's say, don't have any suspect prints to compare it to, we can run it through our APHIS system. And what the, what the technician actually does is take the fingerprint and blows it up about five times and then goes in there and traces it with tracing paper, traces the significant ridge detail. Now that's a tracing. And that is, is what's run through APHIS. And uh, here's a, a hit that she's comparing to it it and uh, she's actually physically comparing it and of course fingerprints is one of the oldest forensic uh, sciences that's uh, I guess that was believed in court uh, comes from way back uh, fingerprints due to their permanence and their individuality can uh, because no two people have the same fingerprints even identical twins uh, but due to their individuality can eliminate or let's say can, when you make a match, you can exclude all other fingerprints if, if it's an uh, actual match. Uh, of course, DNA is the big thing now. And generally, when you talk about DNA, you're talking about nuclear DNA as opposed to uh, mitochondrial. You can look at mitochondrial. But nuclear DNA comes from any nucleated cell, like white blood cells, uh, tissue, uh, semen, um, from uh, cells from the inside of your mouth. Anything that has a nucleus will have nuclear DNA. Now, most, uh, I say most humans, all humans' DNA is essentially the same. There's a very small portion of it that's different, but this difference allows you to develop pro pro profiles which can, um, uh, which are individual to each person. There are, very, there are several different t techniques that are that can be used to look at DNA. Here's the, the uh, oldest uh, type of DNA analysis that used to be done in forensic labs. It's called RFLP, and you can see what that stands for. Um, it requires a pretty good amount of DNA, about, um, let's say, a blood stain the size of a quarter, in order to develop this profile. And what, what you've actually got is, is um, a DNA extract that is subjected to an electric field on a gel, and it separates the uh, pieces of DNA according to their size. Now these, these four kind of almost solid looking ones are, are ladders which are known sizes of DNA, base pairs like 
let's say 50 base pairs, 100 base pairs, 200 base pairs, whatever. And this is actually uh, DNA from, uh, that was extracted, these two, let's say. Uh, you see these two match up. This one in the middle actually matches this one on its right and this one on its left, which kind of indicates that's a mixture. Anyway, that's, this is a very tedious process. It took weeks to, in order to do the tests. Um, very discriminating, though. You could say that DNA from this source was pretty much an identical match uh, to the exclusion of others. Um, but I say due to its complexity, it was abandoned. Um, uh, another technique that was used about the same time is, is a thing called DQ-alpha. It's a single locus analysis, meaning it just looked at one particular area. Uh, and it didn't take very much um, uh, DNA because it, it is a, uh, what's referred to as a polymerase chain reaction, PCR, technique in which small amounts of DNA can be um, multiplied, amplified through, uh, through a process to make billions and billions of copies of this DNA and then it's much easier to look at. Well, the thing, looking at just one spot on the DNA doesn't give you a whole lot of discrimination. You know, maybe let's say one in a hundred, one in two hundred. Uh, that's still pretty good, but nevertheless, it's not, uh, it's not a, a real good match. Now, in today's technology, what we use is a thing called STR, short tandem repeats, which again is a PCR type technique, meaning you just need a little bit of DNA and you can multiply it billions of times using a thermocycler. And we'll actually show a demonstration of how you do that. Um, <clears throat> but it gives extremely discriminating results because we're actually, when we do analysis, we look at 13 separate loci. Uh, there was 13 places on the, on the DNA structure. And when you get a match, especially a 13 loci match, um, typically it's to the exclusion of all other DNA sources except your evil identical twin. Because your evil identical twin who does all these crimes actually has identical DNA to you. And here's what it is. If you look, here's a double-stranded DNA. Of course, DNA is a double strand, <clears throat> when you heat it up, it unzips. And then when you cool it down a little bit, process it, uh, primers attach, these are chemicals we put in it, attach the DNA at a complementary site, and then as the temperature is raised, they extend with other uh, materials that are placed into the mixture and make another copy of DNA, a full copy. And this just goes over and over and over. So you can see, you can start with one strand of DNA, uh, send it through one cycle here, uh, 94 degrees, down to 55 degrees, up to 72 degrees, and then you've got two strands of DNA. And if you do it again, you've got four strands, and then eight strands, and then 16, and 32, and you go on and on, about 30 cycles, and you've got a bunch of DNA. Something that you can actually work with. I mean, amounts so small, let's say on a headband, uh, a sweatband, or a cap, you can extract the DNA off of that or a cigarette butt and, <clears throat> and actually uh, identify a person. Matter of fact, um, that's, um, from what I understand, the shooting of the uh, judge's family up in Chicago. That's the way they identified this person who they felt may have done the murders. Um, they looked at a cigarette butt that he had left in the house and compared it to his DNA, and from what I understand, it was a match. So uh, it doesn't, doesn't take very many things. Uh, when typically when evidence comes in in, in <clears throat> violent crimes, etc., uh, to let's say have DNA or, or serological examinations done, the first thing you do is collect the trace evidence, and that's what she's doing here. She's just taking a piece of tape and taping it to these pants and pulling off hair, fiber, anything like that, anything trace evidence. Here she's looking at it um, under an alternate light source, this, um, this piece of clothing. She's looking for stains, they, they'll glow, uh, especially uh, 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 seminal fluid. And here she's pressing this out to, uh, she, she feels that she has identified uh, seminal fluid in this uh, stain, and she's pressing it out with a wet piece of paper, of uh, filter paper, uh, transferring some of that material on t onto the paper, and then she's treating it with some chemicals which will turn a color and shows that uh, at least uh, presumptively there is semen on that and it's in these locations so you'll see this turn yeah turns purple there and then and then what they'll do is they'll take the uh, 
the pants in this case would make a cutting from it or an extract and actually do the DNA analysis on. Um, <clears throat> DNA analysis uh, turned out to be such a, such a great uh, science in forensics um, that I guess somewhere along the line somebody thought, gee, wouldn't it be nice to have a DNA profile of all the bad guys? Well, the bad guys keep getting arrested over and over. So back in 1995, uh, the, uh, our legislators in their infinite wisdom, and in this case it was infinite wisdom, uh, passed House Bill 40, which required certain types of uh, offenders, uh, convicted offenders, uh, especially sex offenses, um, to provide a DNA specimen uh, when they went into prison. Uh, <clears throat> this number here, I've got 130,000 profiles in the Texas DNA database. Uh, actually, that's 180-something thousand today. Um, <clears throat> and it can be used to, to match DNA evidence left at crime scenes uh, and sexual assaults or burglaries or murders or, you know, whatever, whatever you could lead, leave DNA uh, evidence. Um, matter of fact, I, I saw uh, a uh, memo from... Uh, um, one of my people today that uh, showed a, a sample uh, was placed. What's that thing now? There was a burglary in um, in Austin that the DNA was was matched to a to a uh, CODIS profile. Uh, it was matched within something like ten days from from the time of the burglary. Uh, to the time of the analysis, to the match, was something in the order of 10 days. So, I mean, it was just incredible, you know, it happens that fast. Um, the, way, uh, the way the CODIS program is set up, uh, let me look at my next slide here. Um, actually, all 50 states, as well as Puerto Rico and the Army Lab, et cetera, uh, provides DNA profiles from convicted offenders to a national database controlled by the FBI, and it's actually a three-tiered three structure. Um, a state who participates in the CODIS program, which all states do now, has a database of DNA profiles at their, at their local level. Um, laboratories will have them at their local level, and they upload them to the state uh, administrator, which is in, in my lab, and then qualifying profiles are uploaded to the national or in this um, held by the FBI and this gives um, states around the country the ability to search DNA profiles from other states. Really handy. Uh, another thing we do is forensic photography uh, and besides just uh, crime scene uh, photography which they do a bunch of uh, um, photograph of latent fingerprints, they do that, uh, do digital enhancements, and also this, what you saw before in this, uh, luminol, is a technique that's used quite a bit at crime scenes, especially old crime scenes where you're trying to find out if something happened uh, in the way of spilling blood. And no matter how well you clean it up, you can't clean it up enough so that when you spray luminol on it and turn the lights out, it doesn't glow. It, it, blood can be ancient and it'll still glow with this luminol. Matter of fact, one of the cases I'm going to show you later on, you can reconstruct the whole crime just by looking at the luminol. Uh, forensic firearms is another area that we handle. Um, that's usually called ballistics, but kind of improperly. And uh, there's all kinds of things that they can, they can determine. They can compare cartridge cases and or bullets to particular weapons, cartridge cases and or bullets to each other. Uh, determine caliber and make of an unknown weapon, ammunition identification, like what type of uh, firearm was this, how far was it away. Um, you can restore serial numbers, do tool marks, and we've got some examples of some of these which will uh, kind of make some of this clear. And I had a case one time that um, this ammunition identification really played in uh, um, real heavily. Uh, I, I used to do firearms when I was uh, in our Dallas lab. And I got a case one time from, uh, oh, it was up by Bowie County, and it was a robbery, homicide. A young boy working at a, at a gas station was murdered. And uh, it was all they had was a bullet from the body, and they brought it to me. And this was back before there were so many databases available to look at. And so I just kind of had to use my experience and calling around to figure out that 
this was probably a such and such weapon. I don't remember what type it was. It was kind of an oddball. And so was the ammunition, kind of an oddball. Well, about 150 miles south of there, a few weeks later, there was another similar crime. These two agencies didn't know anything about it, each other. And they sent me the bullet. And I looked at it. Same type of weapon, same type of ammunition. So I got these two agencies together, and they started checking the local gun shops in the, both the areas. And uh, they were able to find a place that sold that type of ammunition. It was kind of an odd, uh, odd uh, manufacturer. Uh, got a list of people who had bought it and actually went and made the arrest. And they, these people were responsible for both murders. So. <clears throat> and uh, the way firearms identification is done, um, I'm sure you all have seen on CSI, especially when they're looking through the microscope and they're turning the bullets around. They've got all the, the micro stria or the scratches on it. Um, you know, how, how does that get there? Well, it's through tool marks, basically. What, are, what you do when you, when you manufacture a weapon, they take whatever type of weapon, a rifle, pistol, whatever, revolver, they take a blank of steel, just like a round tube of steel, and they drill a hole down the center. Pretty amazing to watch this happen. I actually got to go to a place and watch it happen once. Uh, the, the hole is the approximate diameter of the, of the weapon. For instance, 22 caliber would be 22 hundredths of an inch. And once they've got this hole drilled down the barrel and they're satisfied with that, they dr pull through a thing called a brooch, which is a bunch of cutters that are increasingly larger in size. In other words, the first one is just the size of that hole, and the next one's a teeny bit bigger, teeny bit bigger, teeny bit bigger. And that's drawn through and turned as it's drawn through, and it actually cuts out these areas here. These are called grooves, and they're, let's say this thing is turned as it's pulled through, and it cuts spiraling grooves on the inside. That's what's called rifling. Uh, another technique for doing that is drawing this thing called a button through that, through that uh, blank of steel, or through that uh, steel that's been bored out, and it actually just presses down the, the uh, surface and leaves those spiraling grooves in there. Uh, you can imagine the kind of heat that's created because I mean this is this is steel. This is you know it's in plastic. Uh, it's quite a process. Well anyway, what happens when you uh, when you drill that hole down there? This is a cross section or a longitudinal section of of that blank steel. Let's say it goes this way, and this is the hole drilled down the center of it. And the rifling, you can, you can tell it's spiral. You see all those little chuck marks here? That's from the cutting tools that were made to drill that out. Well, all those, those tool marks in there are going to leave scratches on a bullet as a bullet is shoved down through the, through the bore of that weapon. And they're very individual. Um, the class characteristics, in other words, the width of the lands and grooves, uh, are the same for any particular make and, and model of weapon. But the individual characteristics, that is these scratch marks, will be different. I've looked at consecutively made barrels, uh, <clears throat> one in which a piece of steel about this long was cut into four pistol barrels, uh, and test shots made from those, and they didn't look anything alike except for their class characteristics. But individuals were different. Again, this is the uh, actual breech face. Uh, for you all that don't know much about weapons, we'll, uh, uh, the, the cartridge People refer to them as bullets sometimes. The bullet is what comes out the end. The cartridge is the entire case, bullet, powder, primer. Uh, it's encased in a chamber, the back of which is called the breech face. Um, the breech face is machined from steel, and it's going to have markings, usually not this bad. This is a pretty rough example, but uh, tool markings that are left on it. When the cartridge is fired, the bullet goes one way, the cartridge case wants to go backwards because it can't go sideways, it's, it's trapped, and it slams up against this breech face, leaving these marks that are complementary to those. And again, those are most often very unique. Uh, firing pin impressions are not necessarily uh, unique that you can tell anyway. Okay, these are the forces we were talking about. When I punch this, this button the next time, you're going to see what happens. Uh, when you pull the trigger, hammer goes forward. It hits the firing pin, which uh, detonates the uh, primer, which sets the powder on fire. 
uh, creating, expanding gas, pushing the bullet out the end, and the cartridge case backwards. And here's what's happening. Let's see. Do I have to press this again? Yes. And you can see. And then when the cartridge case is extracted out of the weapon, it may have additional individual characteristics from the extractor and or ejector. This is what you see when you look through a um, comparison microscope. Comparison microscope is what's used to examine firearms evidence. And uh, uh, University of Texas really helped me out in this presentation, but they made a couple of little mistakes here, and I'm going I'm to tell Jay about this one. They had a much better picture of a microscope than I had in my presentation, but this isn't a firearms microscope. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate, I appreciate it, though. But here's what you're seeing. You're seeing both stages, both sides, and here is, let's say, the test, and here is the evidence. The, this is the head of the uh, cartridge case. And you can see it with a uh, dividing line down the middle, and that, that's right here. And you can see these marks here match up, and, you know, even I'm sure everybody here can tell that's a match. Uh, this picture here is extractor marks made on this cartridge case. Uh, say when a cartridge case uh, is fired in a, in a pistol, an automatic weapon, it's drawn out of the chamber by a little hook, which is called the extractor. And it will mark the, the cartridge case, the lip of the cartridge case. And again, you can see all that. <clears throat> Here's the way we collect our test shots. I've got the smallest person I could find here. And she's firing into a, a water tank and get the bullet out of the, the water tank. And we wanted to collect some extra cartridge cases here. So okay. she's in. You ready? Ready. Kim. She was real nervous here. She's our new Nibin technician. I like the ponytail jump. And what she's going to do is take these cartridge cases. Let's see, she is our, our Nibin tech. And she's going to take these cartridge cases and enter them into the Nibin database. And Nibin stands for National Integrated Ballistics Identification Network, I believe. And what it is, it's very similar to this AFA system we were talking about for fingerprints, except it's for fired cartridge cases. Uh, you can take an image of that fired cartridge case and put it in its database, this big national database, and then search it should you find a weapon on, let's say, a gang, gang me member or uh, a drive-by shooting from somewhere else, uh, and it will automatically make a match. Of course, again, the human eye actually has to uh, be put on it in order to determine whether it is a match or not. Uh, <clears throat> this is the system we we're talking about, and what it is is it's a... Um, um, it's kind of managed by Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms uh, Agency, and it allows agencies to link cases together that they would have never been able to do any other way. There's, uh, uh, there was a system before this called drug fire that the FBI ran, but uh, ATF and FBI had disagreements on things, and it turned out this was a better system. Uh, of course, the two systems don't talk to each other, so, so it, <clears throat> it was kind of a, kind of a shame uh, that we had a lot, of, a lot of information in one and couldn't use it in the other. But it's, um, it's qu quite, a, quite an interesting system. And here's what she's doing. She's uh, going to enter these in, into Nibin here. Um, this is a great big computer system, basically. This is her terminal. And OK, let's see. OK, here's some of the ones she's, uh, some of the matches that have come up. You can see they're all fairly similar. And here's. On. Here's the one that, um, boy, I didn't get a chance to look at that one. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> that was the best hit she found, and let's see, when you put an eye on it, it actually was a match. And that's, you know, that's the thing about these, these databases, both uh, CODIS, APHIS, and NIBIN. Um, these are the databases that make forensic science do what they used to say it could do way back that it couldn't. Um, you know, you used to see these old cop shows in the 50s and stuff, and they'd get fingerprints, and, well, I mean, they knew who it was in no time. That was impossible. 
now it's almost possible. Um, same thing with uh, uh, with Nibin and uh, uh, and Aphis, I mean, in uh, CODIS. These uh, availability of these things has increased the ability to solve crimes unbelievably. There's also another. There's databases for automobile paint and for fibers and such. Um, it's it's something that we only dreamed about when I first started, but it's here. Uh, one of the things we talked about was tool marks. That's done by the firearm section also. And, and again, you can look at class characteristics. For instance, the spacing on the teeth of a pair of pliers uh, you know, is the same here as it is here. Um, let's say that's a piece of wood or something where they grabbed hold of. And there's individual characteristics too. The t tools, when they're made similar to, uh, to firearms, uh, there's accidental marks left on the tools from the grinding process, etc., and they will leave their markings on softer materials on which they're used. For instance, a, a lock. Uh, when I worked in Garland, I had a case um, that had, uh, oh, I kept getting these locks from uh, Sulphur Springs, that area, some sort of thing, and I finally got a set of bolt cutters, and I matched one of the locks that had been cut. And then, I mean, Katie barred the door. I was getting lock submissions from every you know, podunk, small outfit. And, of course, I, I never matched any more off of that, but uh, it was pretty amazing. I, I never expected to do it myself. Uh, documents or handwriting, which people kind of uh, <laughs> refer to. Uh, besides handwriting, they also look at, of course, we've got typewriters, which nobody uses anymore, but photocopiers, um, rubber stamps, uh, computer data recovery. Matter of fact, computer data recovery is probably over half their work now. Uh, they also make trash bag comparisons, which I've got a picture here in a minute. It's kind of it's interesting. Um, one of the things they'll do, I'll say, is look for alterations in documents. And they use, uh, there's one particular instrument they use called a uh, VSC, a visual spectral comparator, that is an instrument uh, that uses various wavelengths of light. You can, uh, you can alter the wavelength from near infrared to ultraviolet and look at things such as documents underneath it and see how the different, uh, different types of ink will respond. For instance, uh, you, know, you can see what was, what was scratched off on some of these. You can actually read underneath it. Um, another thing is latent writing impression. Uh, for instance, if you have a, a big chief tablet, let's say, and uh, write something, tear it off, Underneath, maybe several underneath, pages underneath, you can actually read what's there if you use oblique lighting, let's say, uh, light at an angle. Or there's another instrument called an ESDA unit, electrostatic discharge apparatus, which is um, this device here. And what they do is they'll take the document, let's say it's the third page of a notebook, and put it on there and put a, uh, something similar to uh, a piece of plastic on top of it and draw a vacuum underneath it and then spray toner on it. And for instance, this document right here, I mean, you can, you can read the seal, you can read the stuff that was written on there. It's pretty slick. Um, I, I noticed out here they had some um, uh, ink chromatography they were doing right out here in the, in the hallway. And that's, that's basically what we're doing here. Uh, inks of the same color may actually appear very different if you separate the components. Um, and, of course, some of y'all actually did this, and all you're doing is taking a, a, a plate with, uh, or paper with um, uh, material on it, uh, spotting your inks, putting it in a solvent, letting the solvent rise up, and it will separate the components. Uh, here is a uh, altered check under this uh, uh, VSC. And you can see where they changed a $35 check to a $285 check. That's what I need. Uh, trace evidence. And trace evidence is all that stuff that um, Sherlock Holmes did. I mean, it's really cool stuff like uh, hairs and fibers and paints and glass and all that stuff that puts people at the scene or puts the scene at people. And it's basically, basically, um, What it says is any two objects, when they come together, leave a little bit of themselves on each other. Whether you can find it or not is another thing. Or <clears throat> you may not know what you're looking for, but they leave a little bit of themselves on each other. 
suspect and victim, victim in the scene, the weapon in the suspect. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> there I am. I'm the victim. Now, I don't know about this weapon, but anyway, whatever. I, I didn't... This is another one of my altered slides, but, but uh, nevertheless, um, basically what you're saying is that any of these things may be able to be connected to each other through trace evidence. And here's the type of things we're talking about, hair, fiberglass, paint, soil, gunshot residue uh, from all different kinds of crimes. And uh, this particular um, section is the... Um, section that gets to use all the neatest equipment, uh, polarizing microscopes, microspectrophotometry, that's a big word, but all that means is that you can take a look at something like a fiber under a microscope and measure the actual color of it. I mean, not saying it's blue, but I'm saying exactly what blue it is, like 650 nanometers versus 640 nanometers. Uh, to your eye, it looked the same, but not to the instrument. Um, they use x-ray diffraction uh, to uh, look at various uh, types of um, um, s soil samples, etc. cetera. Um, uh, a thing called ICP, inductively coupled plasma for gunshot residue. Uh, we're going to go to, to uh, scanning electron microscopy for that next year. Uh, refractive index for glass, gas chromatography, and infrared and emission spec. Uh, lots of very expensive equipment, but you can find some interesting things. These are the types of evidence they may look at. Uh, hairs, fibers, footprints, tire tracks, physical matches, tearing there, um, gunshot residue, and yeah, that's a dead person. <coughs> I saw somebody had a setup out here showing different, uh, different types of hair, and uh, I thought that's kind of interesting because I've got a slide showing the same thing. And this shows variations of Caucasian head hair. I mean, this is all Caucasians, and uh, I guess that's probably the way mine looks kind of gray. Um, but you can see the differences in the uh, cortex and uh, the medulla, the middle layer of the cortex. Uh, if you look close enough, you might see cuticle differences, but all these, all these variations in human head hair, and basically human head hair is, um, you can't ever use it to identify somebody. You may be able to use it to eliminate somebody, or at least to say you can't say. Um, nowadays, uh, they're doing more and more DNA on hair roots, etc., which, uh, of course, is a much better technique. Uh, gunshot residue to determine whether or not a person fired a weapon. Uh, this is a revolver. You can barely tell from all the smoke. And uh, yes, that's the bullet. And you can see what happens when it's fired from the cylinder gap and the uh, end of the barrel. You see all the powder, that, uh, gas that comes out. Well, in that gas, there's small particles that will adhere to your hand. Uh, things like uh, barium and lead uh, and antimony. So what you do is you take either stubs for, for SEM, which are just little sticky things that you press on your, your hand, or dilute acid and swab the hands in these particular locations and run them either on uh, SEM if you're using stubs or uh, ICP for the other materials uh, for these three elements. And of course, nowadays there are a lot of uh, uh, pa uh, primers and, and such that do not have lots of metals in them, uh, and it's getting more and more difficult to make the determination of whether or not a, a uh, uh, weapon was fired. Uh, here was that trash bag I was telling you about. What we've got is an evidence trash bag and something along the lines of, you know, a body being in it or body parts, uh, and, a, and a roll recovered from the suspect is here. Well, when you look at these, <clears throat> you see all the little perforations? I mean, where this one goes out, that one goes in, well that one goes out, that one goes in. And then if you look at the, the striations on the bag, this is actually the next bag in line. It's not just from the same set of bags, it's the next bag in line. Because some of these come at an angle, you see, like that. And those, are, those come from the manufacturing process. So that's uh, that was an interesting case. Uh, here we've got somebody collecting paint samples uh, from a suspected uh, hit and run. Uh, and uh, compared to uh, 
paint samples collected from the officer's uniform. Uh, this is what I spent most of my career actually doing, analyzing dope. Um, <clears throat> DPS let's say, provides forensic services to uh, agencies within the state at no charge to them. Um, out of the approximately 60, 65,000 cases a year we work, about 50,000 of them are drug cases. So it's big business. Um, we use all kinds of all kinds of techniques to do that, from screening tests like um, microscopy and thin layer to instrumental analysis, which was actually required in order to make an identification, uh, typically mass spec or IR. And this is, this is cocaine here. Uh, here's some of the spot tests. Uh, for instance, if you had uh, heroin in a marquee solution, it would look like that. Cocaine would look like that in a spot in a Scott test. Uh, we use polarizing microscopes to do uh, microcrystalline tests occasionally. And uh, marijuana being a plant, uh, really the only thing we have to be able to say is that yes, it's marijuana. It doesn't have to have THC in it, but we'd feel kind of funny calling it marijuana. So what we do is we extract um, the uh, sample spotted on a thin layer plate with a THC standard, such as that, uh, put it in a uh, solvent, um, and let the solvent travel up the plate. Uh, we actually visualize it with a reagent called Fast Blue RR Salt, but uh, for, for this indication, I'm going to say we sprayed it at each interval. So there you can see the separation. Here's our THC, and here's the mixture of uh, uh, the extract of marijuana. You've got your uh, uh, little bit of uh, chlorophyll that's left there. You've got cannabinol, THC, and cannabidiol, three three cannabinoids that you would find in marijuana. And that's what the final product looks like. I said we use flat, fast blue B there. Actually, they use fast blue RR now, which I'm sure makes a lot of difference. <coughs> uh, gas chromatography is another technique that we use uh, mainly for uh, either screening and or quantitation. Uh, and basically, all it is is a big oven with a column going through it and a carrier gas such as uh, helium flowing through there and then the temperature of the column is raised, uh, temperature of the oven is raised, and mixtures, here we've got two different things, let's say, uh, will separate according to the way they, they react within the column, um, typically their boiling point. And if you were to inject that in a sample, here's what would happen. Whoa. They come at it two different places. Uh, what you can do as a detector, you can have various things as a detector. Uh, Typically, what we use for identifications is a mass spectrometer, which is a very specific type of identification. Uh, this is most of the type of dope we get. Of course, we don't like to get fresh plants because they're hard to deal with. Uh, You've got to dry them out. They'll rot in a hurry. Um, but these packages of marijuana are about 30 pounds a piece. Um, here's cocaine. Uh, I like that just too much. So. Uh, and heroin, both uh, dark. Uh, brown and white heroin. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the theory on the street is you can tell how strong it is by the color, but not necessarily so. Uh, some of the dark heroin, which is called tar heroin from Mexico, uh, may range anywhere from 80% uh, down to 3%. Looks the same. White heroin, again, may raise, be in the same range. Uh, Back in the 60s and early 70s, most of the white heroin came out of France and Southeast Asia. Um, I would say most of the heroin in the 90s came out of Mexico uh, and maybe places like Afghanistan. Here's a microscopic view of marijuana. This is real good marijuana. Um, these are the uh, flowering tops, and you can see the glandular hairs, which are heavy in THC. I mean, they're just shiny. Uh, and another thing we look for is systolithic hairs. And like I say, we can report marijuana just by its characteristics alone, but we, we do test it for THC. Uh, you notice it's spelled with an H there. That's the way it's spelled in the law. Um, opiates, here's where the opiates come from. Uh, uh, poppies, typically, uh, say, Mexico, Afghanistan, <coughs> Far East. Uh, they'll take the poppy pod, uh, slit it, and as the, the uh, gum or latex comes out of it, they'll scrape it off, and that is uh, raw 
opium, and that's converted to morphine base, which is in turn converted to heroin. Uh, of course, the scourge nowadays is methamphetamine. Uh, you don't see big meth labs like this anymore. <clears throat> when I was uh, working on the bench, typically people were making pounds of methamphetamine, and now they're making small amounts, what we call Walmart labs, using uh, um, pseudoephedrine, lithium batteries, that sort of thing. But even though they're, they're small in, <clears throat> in size, they still produce a lot of waste, which, of course, most of these folks don't care about the waste, and uh, you end up with some pretty nasty places. This is what most of the labs look like now. I mean, it looks like just household stuff. Uh, and the cocaine, of course, starts off with the coca leaves, and those are extracted uh, through uh, several different techniques can be used, and it's turned into cocaine, um, cocaine hydrochloride, which is salt. And this is a full kilo of cocaine. You notice it's marked Marlboro. Well, that's a, the markings are done by the manufacturer, the one who's actually packaging it up, uh, to demonstrate that it's theirs and, you know, there's a certain quality involved. And I'll show you some pictures of a great big case here in a little while that uh, has all kinds of markings. Uh, crack cocaine is just cocaine base. They take the cocaine hydrochloride, strip off the HCL, and it becomes cocaine base. It's smokable and more potent. And, of course, we're, we see lots of club drugs now, X, LSD, Special K. Uh, here's some of the cases we worked on. Uh, this one right here. This is 18,360 pounds of cocaine hydrochloride, and uh, I always say that's me when I was young and pretty. Uh, that was in 1989, and what this was was uh, this was the Mexican drug kingpin, a fellow called Juan Garcia Abrego. Uh, he was responsible for the uh, importation of multi-multi-tons uh, um, of cocaine. This was all actually seized in one place in South Texas. Uh, bad move to keep that much dope in one place. Well, they, they did, and uh, apparently some snitch rolled over on them, and uh, they, they brought this to me, actually called me the night before and said, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a lot of dope. And I said, how much? And they said, about 5,000 pounds. And I said, wow. And uh, he calls me back about an hour later and says, no, it's more than that. It's more like five tons. Well, the next day, of course, the news media is out in front of the building, and uh, they showed up in two rider trucks, and uh, it actually didn't look like this. It was in 263 boxes and duffel bags. Right there, that's what it looked like. Um, and you can see all these different markings. This baby, Ford, Royal. I don't know what that is. but <clears throat> um, Each one of these duffel bags had about, I'm thinking around 75 pounds. That would be uh, about 30-something kilos in each one of those duffel bags. Um, testified on that case probably, oh, maybe 10 times, 10, 12 times against different people, including Juan Garcia Abrego himself. He was actually in Mexico, and the Mexican government captured him, uh, uh, made a deal with DEA and turned him over, and he was tried in Houston, given 11 life sentences. He was uh, fined um, two. I've got these figures here. Somewhere around $200 million by the judge. No, it was $200 million worth of assets seized. And see, this is a good number, so I want to get it. No, he was fined $128 million above and beyond the jury's forfeiture of $350 million in assets. Um, he was, he was quite a, a guy. He had a number of people, witnesses, that would have testified against him murdered. So it was a little bit dicey going to places to testify because uh, he had, in fact, he had two people in Brownsville murdered before the trial. So <clears throat> um, Another case that we got involved in, we didn't actually do that much really neat stuff, but we helped unearth the bodies. Uh, Madeline Murray O'Hare, for y'all who remember, you know who she is, for, for y'all who don't know, she was a famous atheist from back in the uh, uh, 60s who uh, stopped prayer in school, etc. And uh, she had a whole organization, this uh, American atheist or whatever. Um, and, you know, had a pretty good business going there, collecting lots of money. And she hired a fellow named David Waters, who uh, he was ex-con. And he was stealing money from her, I believe. And uh, she told everybody, made him look real bad. And he hated her for that. And so he and two other fellows, 
1994, I believe it was, kidnapped her and her son and uh, daughter, or granddaughter, I forget, and took them to San Antonio. She lived in Austin. <clears throat> took them to San Antonio and held them hostage for quite some time, all this time uh, forcing them to drain money out of accounts. Matter of fact, they uh, drained as much as, I believe, $600,000 and bought gold coins with it. And then they took these gold coins and stored them in a storage locker, you know, one of these you rent places, and a couple of teenagers broke into it and stole those gold coins. <laughs> <clears throat> they were living high on the hog, I'll tell you, for a long time. But anyway, what happened was uh, after they did that, um, he murdered all three of them, uh, or they murdered all three of them, and um, cut them up and buried about by Camp Wood, Texas. And as part of a uh, plea bargain, he managed to tell everybody where, where she was buried. Um, and you can see, of course, there's a skull. I don't know which one skull that is. I didn't go out there, thank goodness. But you can see this leg was sawed off about mid-thigh. Uh, that was a uh, artificial hip, had a serial number. That was Madeline Murray O'Hare's hip, sure was. So that was one of the things they used to identify. Uh, the, here was a case in Round Rock, actually about six blocks from where I live. Young girl, 13, um, had a little friend next door. Uh, she was over at his house. Something went tragically wrong. We don't really know what. Uh, but he stabbed her to death. And he stabbed her many, many times. And most of the stabbings were done, uh, were just very... Uh, light stabs, but she was a real small girl and uh, managed to stab her in the neck at one point, which she just bled to death from that stab wound. It may have only been a half an inch deep, but it hit her um, uh, carotid artery. She's a very a small girl. Uh, there's, you probably can't see it that well in this photograph, but there's a, a mark on her arm right there, and you can see little dots. Those serrations match this uh, uh, kitchen knife. He washed the knife and put it back. Uh, after he killed her, he took her and dumped her in the backyard and put wood on top of her. I guess like no one will find her here. <laughs> um, on the body, there was a small paint chip on her arm and right there. And that could actually be put back into place on the wall where the knife went down and, and hit the wall with figure it was from that, that, that knife. Uh, we were talking about that luminol, and here's what it was. Here was the hallway, and of course you can actually see some blood there, but uh, uh, when asked what, what happened by his father, uh, he said the dog hit him in the nose and he got a nosebleed. Well, you know, there's quite a bit of blood there, but, he, but not to worry, he cleaned it up. And matter of fact, this kid was pretty smooth. He even went next door because the little girl was missing. She was missing overnight. Uh, and Ed, or asked to help the family, you know, can I aid you in your comfort? comfort? I mean, he's only 12. He's a pretty smooth operator. <coughs> well, anyway, when they finally found the body and f figured out what happened, uh, here's, uh, here's the hallway. Here's the uh, living room. Um, it was sprayed with luminol, and you can see all these spatter marks of blood from the stabbing her and casting it off, and that's all up in here. Uh, in here, of course, there's a massive amount of blood because he was trying to, trying to mop it up and clean it up with cleaners and solvents and stuff. Didn't do too good. Uh, but here, he's, he's cleaning up some of the blood in the uh, um, living room and you even used the vacuum cleaner, and you can see where the vacuum cleaner marks are. And there's another picture that I, didn't, I couldn't find, but there's pictures out in the um, garage where he was walking around out in the garage afterwards and they sprayed Amido Black, which is a technique used for latent prints that'll, that'll bring up latent prints in blood. And you can see his bloody footprints that brought up uh, um, when they sprayed it all over the garage where he walked around the garage. Very sad story. He got 30 years because that's all they could give somebody of his age. So I guess he'll be out. And see, that happened about around 89 or so. So it was about 16 years. He's about half done. Here was another case, a fellow named Roger Skaggs, local businessman. Um, I think he'd been married to Penny, his wife, for 35 years or something, and had him a young girlfriend. That, that's his daughter there. But he had him a young, younger woman. It's usually something like that happens. And um, 
he decided he didn't want to give up all the stuff he had earned because he was pretty rich, and so he figured he'd kill his wife and make it look like a burglary. So he whacks her upside the head with a pipe, stabs her, steals some jewelry, takes the pipe, the knife, the jewelry, and the rubber gloves he was wearing and throws them in the dumpster at his work. Pretty smooth. Well, I don't have the pic that picture, but anyway, what happened was the police, not being terribly stupid, as he thought they were, that's the first place they looked was at his work. And they recovered this trash bag with all his stuff in there. Well, you could take the pipe and you could actually lay that image across the wound on her face and it's perfect match. I mean, there you go. Uh, in addition, there was a pair of gloves inside there, pulled inside out, and when you looked at them, you can see ridge detail from the friction ridges of his skin. So his fingerprints are on the inside of those gloves, and guess what's on the outside of them? Her blood. That's very hard to explain, how her blood <laughs> got on the gloves that you were wearing. That's, you almost can't explain your way out of that. So anyway, there's, there's lots of other cases that we've worked on, cases that you've seen in the newspaper, et cetera, and, uh, include, including things like the yogurt shop, um, um, Kenneth McDuff, serial killer uh, from started off in the 60s killing people um, and got was a <clears throat> was sent uh, given the death penalty and then um, that was uh, changed to life during the uh, late 60s late 60s early 70s and um, then he was let out of prison eventually in the 90s and managed to kill another at least another five women before he was caught including he killed a couple of women here in Austin um, but anyway, we work, we work a lot of that stuff. Um, uh, the shooting at uh, the Lubies and Colleen, we, we were there at that. So uh, we've, we've handled a lot of high-profile cases, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been, a, been a good career for me, and uh, I think most of the young people, uh, like the people I brought with me today, I think they've been enjoyed their, their work, and uh, I can't imagine doing anything different. Okay, um, if you have to leave, please do so very quietly because we're going to start with questions. All right, so this is the question and answer period, so you need to be quiet so we can hear the questions that are being asked. Okay, that would mean don't talk as you're leaving. Thank you. I'm sure that. Uh, Mr. Ginn would be happy to answer questions and will be able to answer questions, unlike David Caruso. So go ahead, call, call on whoever you like. Gee. You're easy to see. Um, we, okay, he, he asked, how do we get rid of all the drugs that we get? Uh, well, um, if, if, we, if our agency, the Department of Public Safety, did not seize them, after analysis we return them to the submitting agency and let them deal with it. Um, if, if our agency seized it, such as that big cocaine case, uh, they're incinerated. Uh, we have, uh, get a contract with a commercial incinerator. Uh, uh, things like cocaine require specialized treatment during incineration. So but basically we pay something in the neighborhood of $2 a pound to get rid of it. Yes. How does the silencer on a gun work? Uh, you saw that demonstration where the, uh, the bullet in the gas goes out the barrel. Uh, what makes a gun make its noise is all that high velocity um, gas going out of the end of the barrel. So what a silencer does is it's just an extension of the barrel with a bunch of little holes in it that lets the gas escape more slowly. And it's kind of like a muffler on a car. How long does gun residue last on a hand? Uh, not very long. Uh, if you were to wash your hands or something, it'd be gone. Uh, typically, I think they like to collect it within a couple of hours, if possible. So, yeah. Um, there was a murder in, uh, I think, in the Hyde Park area back in the 80s. It was called the Susan Wolf murder. Do you remember anything about that? Did you have any? Was that where the guys went to California afterwards? I, you know, I don't know. I didn't hear anything I, I, about I it. Remember, I can't remember the name, so I don't know. 
I know, I know there was one in, in Hyde Park uh, about that time. There was a couple of fellows that went to California that were responsible, and they ended up committing suicide out there. But that may not be the case. I'm not sure. It might be. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you know what kind of evidence they're going to use to try and prosecute the BTK killer? Uh, BTK killer, what kind of evidence? Um, boy, that's good. Uh, you know, I believe the evidence collected at the times of the murders was done so very well. Uh, they did a very good job collecting it. So there would probably be DNA evidence, I would think. So. Yes? I'm just curious about how some of the methods of forensics sort of developed, like the super glue. I mean, how are these things developed and then when they're developed, how is that information sent? To give you an example, uh, I don't know if everybody heard that, but she's wanting to know, like, how, let's say, how super glue method was developed and then how is the information disseminated. So, in, Brian can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the uh, super glue was kind of an accidental find uh, by the, the people that actually manufactured it. Uh, gee, there's fingerprints in there. Be because it's, I mean, it just coats everything. Um, is that right, Brian? Well, wasn't it? Yeah, back in 1978, uh, I believe the Japanese kind of accidentally came upon this, and some, uh, some other uh, um, universe or something were using cyanoacrylic ester, which is the actual ingredient. They're using that in their in their laboratories and found out that their own prints were being developed on on their glass and inside the packages. Okay. Yeah. That, so it was, that was kind of an accident. Now, as far as the way most most information is disseminated nowadays, uh, we're very big into uh, uh, training and meetings and uh, documents. You know, uh, uh, getting documents from other laboratories. Uh, um, magazines, etc. The forensic community is not real big. Uh, you know, it's probably not as big as you think it is. So, uh, for instance, in the state of Texas, there's probably only, I'm going to guess, 350, 400 people maybe that, that do this. So it is a fairly small group. Yeah? What does it take to get a job with you guys? Okay, good question. What does it take to get a job? Um, most of the areas, and I'll say most of the areas, uh, DNA, uh, toxicology, trace, drug analysis, um, most of them are either chemists, biologists, botanists, um, geneticists, heavy in science. Uh, degrees in criminal justice don't do you any good. Now, the, we do have people that do things like firearms and latents and such that do not have science degrees, uh, but they have, usually have some science. Um, but typically, if, if it's the kind of thing that you want to get involved in, a science degree is where you want to go. Uh, bachelor of Science, yeah. Um, well, now, did you have a role in the Walker Riley case? No. Matter of fact, I don't know if our if our Dallas lab had anything to do with that either. Uh, here at Austin, I don't remember any, any involvement in that. So, uh. is is it still under scrutiny? That's not our lab. Okay. That, that belongs to Houston Police Department. Okay. We do have a lab in Houston, but uh, they're clean as a whistle. <laughs> <laughs> how do you measure how busy you are? Is it caseload? Pretty much. Uh, we're always behind. Uh, business is good. Where's that? Uh, it varies from lab to lab and section to section. Uh, typically, um, it can be anywhere from... Uh, Three weeks to six months, depending on what type of area and which lab. Hey, hey Bill, we're yeah. going to take a question from the uh, internet, from the webcast, the live okay. webcast audience. And before we do, let's let's all thank the Center for Instructional Technology for putting on the webcast. Yeah. <laughs> this, this question comes from Torian. She asks, "How long has forensic science been around?" And that's a question I can't hardly even answer. Uh, pro Probably longer than we know. I'm going to say it in, so, in some in some way or another. Um, of course, the things like firearms and fingerprints and stuff have been around for. I don't know, help me out here. Uh, fingerprints. When was it? Uh, oh, it's been around for a real long time. Um, 1904 is um, roughly around the time right. it came to the United States of America, the St. Louis World's Fair. Right. 1911 is actually the first court conviction that was made based on fingerprint identification. I'm going to say modern, yeah, modern forensic science probably about 100 years, and that would be things like firearms and fingerprints mainly. Yes? Were you involved with that investigation, Willis County, of the uh, 
Uh, over, um, yeah, um, yes. Uh, the young lady was stabbed like 90 some odd times. I had the young man in question in my classroom. I knew the young lady that were both honors and tag students. Yes. At that point in time, there was another young man that was questioned extensively. Did the evidence indicate that he was eliminated from, from the scene? You know, I, I, I don't know enough uh, specific about that case. I mean, I, I know I know this fellow was convicted, uh, but I, I'm, anybody else, I'm not. You know, I personally didn't have any involvement in it. Our lab did, but uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, typically, how long can you recover latent prints? <laughs> I'm gonna ask my expert. Uh, the time frame. I mean, it really depends on. A whole bunch of different factors come into play. I mean, if the item that was touched and preserved, I mean, a uh, print can remain on an object for several years. If it's touched in a way where something could come across and wipe that print off, I mean, it may not last but you know, two or three seconds. So it really depends. What uh, book or books would you recommend for further general reading for this? General reading? Um, You know, I'd, I'd have to get back with you on that. If, if you uh, if you'll give me your name afterwards, I'll, I can I can get you some good names. Uh, a book. A lot of them are. Um, you know, it depends on how technical you want to get. I mean, there's there's some that are kind of in the middle that that you may be interested in. I can get the information for you. So. How long does a typical DNA test actually take to run to get the results? The guards have to wait to finally get around to do it. Right. Right. Says <laughs> And also, uh, different cases have uh, different numbers of samples. You, uh, you know, a simple case may have five, seven samples. A complicated case may have dozens of samples. So, yeah. Um, what's the longest case you've ever worked on? The longest case I've ever worked on. Oh, jeez. See, I haven't worked a case in so long. <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, you know, the, probably the one, one of the ones I was involved with the longest was this big cocaine case because there were so many defendants. It was such a big ring of uh, organized crime that I, <clears throat> that case was actually seized in 1989, and I testified about six or eight months later in Brownsville the first time, and then the last time I testified on that case was maybe uh, six or seven years later. So I mean, I testified somewhere in the neighborhood of ten or twelve times over over a period of seven years, and it was a lot of. Um, the the characters on CSI Las Vegas, they actually sometimes they, they carry guns and they will actually go to someone's home and knock on the door and speak with them. Would we don't do that. We don't do chalk outlines, <laughs> and we uh, we don't carry guns. We're not commissioned. Uh, the only involvement uh, that I've ever had with with crooks is uh, going on uh, clandestine drug labs and you know I go, would go on the search warrant when that search warrant was actually executed uh, because cops didn't want anybody getting hurt so they'd bring the chemist <coughs> let him get hurt uh, <laughs> but sometimes it, there was, it was so uh, so confusing in there that uh, you wanted some input from the crook like uh, what do we have here um, but that, that would be, that's the only time I would actually get involved with them. So. Uh. Um, the evidence that's collected for suspects, not necessarily the guilty party in DNA in particular, does that get entered into CODIS and into INDIS? No. It's only of the convicted? Convicted, right. Or, or unknown samples, uh, you know, like an unknown, uh, say, semen sample from a victim that will get uh, searched in CODIS, yeah. Oh, there's been a lot of them. I just, um, you know, one of the ones I was telling you about that firearms case where we had firearms from two different places, murders in two different places. The way that was, <clears throat> besides knowing the, uh, or figuring out the manufacturer of the, of the weapon and the ammunition and both being kind of odd, 
when they arrested the fellow, uh, I couldn't match um, the bullets to the gun, even though I, I knew pretty well it was, because they were just so torn up. Um, but, and plus it was a cheap weapon, had been fired a lot in between. And, but there were some, some bullets that he had fired into a hen house playing around practicing in between the two murders that you could actually take those and match them to both of, of those and, and match that one to the gun. So it was kind of a circular way around it, but uh, um, they gave both those fellows the death penalty, so it was a pretty serious case, yeah. So you mentioned most of your work is in drugs. Is that just basically confirming that, you know, what police have confiscated is, a, you know? Yes, yeah, we, uh, and, and so is there any kind of effort to make, like, a field test that they can use to offer this there, there are field tests available now, uh, but I tell you, you don't ever want cops to practice chemistry. They're just not very good at it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they, uh, I don't know if you ever saw the movie uh, Up in Smoke uh, with Cheech and Chong. <laughs> well, they're, they're testing the babo or something, and they say it's turning blue. You know, well, that's a typical test you use for cocaine turns blue, you know. So it's kind of an inside joke. But, but that's the kind of things we'd get from an officer. He'd bring something in and say, Man, this is dope. This thing really kicked the tester. And I'll say, well, I'll be the judge of that. And what it was was they, uh, they arrested some kid at SMU or someplace that had 10 little bags of white powder. And boy, they thought they had the last of the big time dopers. And he told them, my mom packages up uh, laundry detergent in these so I don't have to measure it out. And they said, yeah, that's a good story. So anyway, they brought it in to me, and they're all puffed up, standing around, you know, and I said, well, let's take a look at it. So I looked at it, and I said, doesn't look like cocaine. So I tested it, and you know, it didn't do anything, of course, you know. Smelled it. Soap. Uh, so I told him, uh, he was telling you the truth, and they just couldn't believe that that wasn't dope. So, you know, it's, that's why you don't want cops practicing chemistry. Yeah. I'm really curious about the... Uh, the uh, additive, luminol. Uh -huh. How was it invented? Is that something I don't know how that was invented. I really don't. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it's a good, great technique, though. Yeah. Um, how many cases have you dealt with that involve bombs? Oh, uh, you know, we've kind of just gotten back into the bomb business. Um, we uh, we used to refer most of that stuff to uh, ATF. Um, but uh, my boss is, uh, I would say he's into bombs. He, he likes that explosives analysis. And uh, so we've, uh, we're kind of back into it, but uh, not, uh, we, have, we haven't done very much, so, yeah. Does your office do anything with the behavior patterns? The no, policies? no. Okay, yeah. I think I saw, read an article saying how juries are, they're not watching these CSI shows and they're now being more intelligent on like, Wait, you don't have the weapon, but you have him in all these situations. Do you find that's really helping your labs? Um, yeah, I'll pretty much bring yeah. more money for you guys to buy better equipment. So no, that'll never happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll tell you what it does do. It, it, it makes the jury think you ought to be able to tell them more than you can. Now, that's the downside. But the upside is they, uh, I think they're more interested uh, in what's going on. You know, I mean, I've testified times where jurors were falling asleep. That's pretty sad. So. What percentage of your lab's cases go unsolved, and when do you just give up? Well, we don't, so it's, not, it's not really up to us to, to give up on it. We, uh, we work it as long as we need to work it and as long as we've got evidence. Um, but as to what number get, remains unsolved, it's probably, uh, you know, whatever the, whatever the average is on murders, which I think is around, and maybe you, you guys know, maybe around... 15, 20 percent, something like that, and most murders are just kind of unsolved, so and that's probably about right. So, yeah. Does the federal government allot you money to take care of things like this, or is it only on the state level, and how much of a, what kind oh. of priority do you have as far as budgeting goes on the as, state as what? level? What kind of a priority does your department have as far as on a state level? I mean, do they say, oh, you guys just take what money you need? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> 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 yeah, do we just take how much money we need? We'd love to. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the state doesn't really even fund us as much as they should. Um, um, we, we've actually had to resort to things like uh, we charge rest, or we don't. The courts can charge restitution to 
drug offenders who are given probation to the tune of $140 for our analysis, and then we get the money. You know, it comes out to mm, quite a bit of money a year, a million bucks a year or so. Um, and then we, of course, apply for numerous federal grants. I think this year we're probably sitting at about $3 million for federal grants just this year. And typically we spend about, I want to say, 40 to 45 percent more than the state actually funds us for. But we, uh, through these grants and restitution, et cetera, that's how we make it up. So, yeah. You may not know the answer to this, and if so, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> sure. When you visit the airport and you get swabbed by the TSA and some parts of your uh, luggage get swabbed by the TSA, do you happen to have any idea what kind of technology is used behind that? And the reason that I'm asking the question is I'm a recreational shooter. Uh -huh. And I'm, I often wonder whether something on my clothing or my luggage is going to set off alarms when I visit right. the airport and get swabbed. Right. You know, I, I, bel I believe they're, they're uh, using uh, mass spec of some, you know, some technology involving mass spectrometry. Um, see, I had the same, the same worry. I work in a crime laboratory. You know, there's things like explosives in there. Uh, and I took, I went to California and I had my laptop with me and they swabbed it off and I thought, oh gee, I better get my ID out here, you know. And uh, apparently the threshold is high enough so that they're not going to get a lot of false positives. So, uh, uh, have you ever, been uh, asked anything? Or? No. Oh, I, good. I, I, <laughs> so you probably don't have I, to worry. I've also never gone to the airport straight from the range. I just, uh, that that, that, that I might be a factor. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know what, what kind of sensitivity they're looking at. But, uh, I asked Dave what is the TSA. Uh -huh. and, uh, they, they, they told me that those machines are designed to find high explosives. Okay. So they're not, work, so they're, yeah, right. they're not black so powder. much for black powder right. or propellants that fire right. the whole weapon. Okay. That would make sense. So. Yeah. Do you know that colleges offer uh, majors in forensics? You know, typically colleges that offer forensic degrees, unless they're master's level or something, sometimes aren't that good. Uh, I know Cecily went to Central, and they have a good, pretty good program. Uh, okay. Uh, is that? And I don't know in Texas for undergraduate programs. Do you know? They didn't have anyone else. Okay. <laughs> they've got they've got a graduate program at Sam Houston now. I know that. Um, uh, typically, if you're interested, um, you, know, you can do as, as good with a chemistry degree. Uh, where a lot of these things fall short is they give you a little bit of science in a lot of areas, but not a whole lot in any one. So unless it's master's level or something, you, you may not really have enough to get past the screening process. You know, we get more applications than we, than we do interviews. I mean, we'll, we'll post a job sometime and get I think on that last DNA thing, they had, what, something like 90, 100 applications. And these, they screened out everybody that didn't have a master's. So, you know, it's uh, uh, a lot of interest in it. So, uh, yeah. Um, approximately how long can you still use DNA um, to find a victim? Um, and after that time period, what other methods are used? How long can you use a DNA analysis, and after that time period, what sort of methods are used to identify a victim? Or well, again, like DNA is kind of like fingerprints. It depends on the circumstance, like the environmental. Um, if you are, if you expose your DNA say, to a lot of heat, or um, it's degraded in some way, it's, you're not going to be able to give a DNA profile. Uh, you can have a stain be um, 10 years old, and if it's been kept in a dry conditions and not in light, you can still obtain a DNA profile. And if you um, end up not being able to get a DNA profile, there's other uh, facets of forensics that can be used. So oftentimes we'll, we'll screen the evidence first for DNA, and if it's not successful for DNA, we can take it to either trace or we can take it possibly, depending on the item, to late print. There's a lot of other different things to do. And also, if uh, medical people get involved, uh, uh, for instance, in mass disasters and stuff, one of the techniques they use more than anything is uh, dental record identification. That's that's something that's not going to go away as long as you have enough of the jaws left. So. Uh. Identical twins have identical DNA. But yes. Not identical fingerprints. Right. How about other cells? Semen, epithelial, hair. 
Uh, their DNA is identical. So why aren't their fingerprints the same? Because there's, it's not, that, that's more environmental than it is genetic. I'm sure there's a genetic component in it. I think Brian would agree, but it's, it's mainly environmental, uh, your development. The, uh, the, uh, why don't identical twins have identical fingerprints? Um, well, the fingerprints are actually developed before you're born, developed actually on the fetus before birth. And um, I mean, the patterns that develop have somewhat to do with um, genetics, but you know, there's different stresses that are placed on that fetus, causing differential growth of the ridges, the friction ridges on the fingers, which cause your fingerprints to be different. So you can't even blame that on your evil twin, so. so. <laughs> Oh, good question. I think it's the it's the heme, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but I, anything else that makes it glow, I, I I couldn't tell you. I've I've never used it myself. So. Metal reacts with women also. You'll get a nice luminescence with metal. Um, also, a lot of some of the different vegetables, fruits. It, it completely depends. Have you ever been involved in any cases where insect evidence was used? No, I haven't, but I think it's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I it is, yeah. How long do you think the evidence after a penis Like I said, evidence that we don't... Um, I mean, let me go back to that. Um, we don't get rid of evidence until we have the, the legal authority to get rid of it. We don't just get rid of it on our own. We're tired of looking at this you know, and chunk it. Uh, now we, uh, for instance, in, in drug cases and such, we we uh, either have to get an okay from the officer for, or from the court uh, before we get rid of it. So. Hey, William, let me uh, interject here. The person who asked the second to last question was Dr. John Abbott, who gave an outreach lecture on right insects. Now. I don't know if you, any of you are here. And we had some cookies with insects in them and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> I want to follow up a question someone else asked about a good book to read about this stuff. Is there a good book on uh, using insects to solve crimes? Uh, yeah, there's a couple. One that I recommend a lot is by Emily Goff. It's called Apply for the Prosecution. And it's a really easy read, but it's got a lot of good science in it, too. And uh, he goes through and talks about a lot of the cases that he was involved in and how he figured them out. And um, He's one of the few real forensic entomologists in the country. He's actually in Hawaii, but it's a really good read. That's, that's, I think you could probably pick it up at a local bookstore. But What's the author's last name? Yeah, Goff, G-O-F-F, -F, M. Lee Goff. What's the title? A Fly for the Prosecution. Did you all hear that? M. Lee Goff, A Fly for the Prosecution. Does anyone have a last question for uh, William Gibb? <clears throat> Brian answered this question for me. If they burn their finger real bad, would the fingerprint that comes back be different? Um, no, as long as the damage goes beneath the epidermal layer, there's a, actually a basal or generating layer in the, the bottom layer of the epidermis, and if that damage um, goes beyond that layer, then that layer or area of skin where the ridges were will not be the same. But that, of course, the area around that scarring, around the burn, um, if that wouldn't affect, if that wouldn't burn, then of course that much detail will, will remain. And then of course the scar, which that will actually be like a kind of like an accidental characteristic, something that we could still use for for identification purposes. So if you wanted to cover up your crime by burning your fingerprints, you should really be very thorough. <laughs> <laughs> just just clip them off. <laughs> One last question from our recreational shooter. <laughs> well, that leads me to a question, which is. How many points, how much of a fingerprint is necessary for you to get an identification? What, how much of an area or how many fingers or? Well, actually there's, there's no scientific basis that, that tells any, any examiner like, you don't, there's no set number of points. It's, it really depends. I mean, you could have a, a latent print that's developed in a scene that, that you know, a lot of, lot of detail, really low quality, or you could have, uh, or vice versa. I mean, it just really depends on the print. Yeah, a, a suitable print could be actually the size of uh, the very tip of an eraser. You could have enough, enough quantity in there for the identification to be made. Um, or, or you could have, on the vice versa, you could have a very large area with not enough detail for identification to be made. So it really depends on the latent at the scene. And that, that goes along with uh, firearms evidence, too. Uh, there's no set number of 
matching microstria. Uh, I say, well, it's ten, ten points. Uh, there's no set number because there's a, a quality of uh, stria, uh, their arrangement, and that's something that comes through experience, saying that this is a match, or I can't tell if this is a match. It's uh, more of an uh, acquired uh, experience than anything else. Well, let's let's thank William again for his excellent presentation.